I study the intersection of this risk gene, APOE4, um, which is a lipid metabolism gene and Alzheimer's disease. And my um, kind of the big picture of my work is to try to figure out, are there diet and supplement recommendations that we should be giving uh, people for, like what should we be doing in terms of diet, supplements, other things to prevent or treat early stages of Alzheimer's? And are they different for different groups of people? Are they different for men and women? Are they different for people who carry these different risk genes, this APOE4 risk gene? As of right now, 9-9-2021, um, <laughs> we don't have strong grade A recommendations that are different for E4 carriers or non-carriers, okay? Um, that's the research program, but right now I don't have, aha, you should take this supplement and then this group should not take it. So when I was working in Dr. Kraft's lab, she was doing tons of diets and diet and exercise studies to kind of prove this concept and to show if you get people on a better diet and get them on exercise, you can improve their cognition and all this kind of stuff. So she put people, older adults, either on an unhealthy Western diet, which is high fat, or a healthy or low fat diet and watched them for a month and then tested their cognition um, and tested a bunch of markers of insulin resistance. For individuals without the Alzheimer's risk gene, the unhealthy diet seemed to worsen their cognition and their insulin resistance went up and all this kind of stuff. And then the healthy diet, all the reverse things happened. For the E4 carriers, which made up a small number of people, um, it seemed to be the reverse. Um, the E4 carriers that happened to be randomized to the Western high fat diet actually did not get insulin resistant. And in fact, their glucose levels dropped, which is just not supposed to happen. Your glucose levels are not supposed to go down when you eat a high fat diet for four weeks. Um, I thought that was very weird. Um, and their cognitive ability actually got a little better on a couple of tests after eating the high fat. Um, compared to the E4 carriers that ate the, the high carb diet or the supposedly healthier diet. Because this was such an unusual and novel finding, and it's a little bit, um, you know, it's a little bit paradoxical, right? You know, why is it that this group of people are behaving um, opposite to what we know is true? Um, you're supposed to have insulin resistance when you eat high fat. I wrote it up and I got, I asked the NIH for a grant and I said, can I study this further? And they said, yes. Um, and so that's what I'm doing with my meal and memory study. What the meal and memory study is designed to do is to test acute effects of high fat versus high carb feeding in a group of healthy older adults that have either the risk gene or not. Um, and it's, it's only a single meal at a time. So I really won't be able to tell like big giant risks or anything. Um, but what I'm testing there is, um, hey, what happens with their peripheral insulin resistance and then their brain chemistry um, with spinal fluid and some other uh, markers that we're getting. This is very interesting to me. So I have this group of older adults that eats a high fat meal, a high fat breakfast, and then on a different day, those same people eat a low fat breakfast. And when you compare the care E4 carriers to the non-carriers with the low fat breakfast, you don't see too many differences with the me metabolism and the cognition and those kind of things. But when you compare now, when you look at the data and just look at the high fat breakfast data, things start popping out. What we show is after the high fat feeding, those individuals that carry the E4 gene, they showed, um, they did better on the cog testing um, they showed a, a more significant drop in their blood pressure at two hours. They showed a different um, spinal fluid to um, plasma glucose profile. So there's a different connection between their brain and blood glucose. And they actually got fuller faster when they ate the high fat compared to the non-carriers. And again, we didn't see these same changes with the high carb meal. 
So that just kind of blows my mind. It's not just, okay, E4 carriers just eat less or whatever. It's a specific interaction. It's what we call a diet by E4 interaction. It's very interesting and it may show that um, I, I'm right about my hypothesis that I found way back in the day when I was working with Dr. Kraft, that there is something weird here going on with high fat feeding and E4 carrier state. And what that is, I think we're still trying to figure out, is it maybe they make more ketones and that's good for their brain and it's not really the high fat, it's the ketones. And that would be kind of nice because we don't necessarily want people to be on high fat diets, right? Um, or maybe it's high carb diets aren't great for them. Or, you know, there's a whole bunch of hypotheses that we can test with this study um, once we get all the samples and then we can measure all, measure all the things. Um, but it's, it's definitely popping out on all of the prelim analyses that I'm looking at is that there's something different about feeding a high fat meal to E4 carriers um, in terms of brain and body metabolism that I think needs to be explored more. I don't know yet. Um, that's one of the really um, exciting but frustrating things about being like being a researcher, but also being a clinician is I don't know what that means for a person, but I've had a lot of my patients tell me, oh, if I eat this, I feel tired. Or if I eat this kind of meal, I feel more energized. And so I just kind of, you know, give them the information and say, well, you know, that's good to know. And for you, it may be that if you eat a lot of food or you eat a lot of you know, simple carbs or whatever, that doesn't make you feel well and go with your body too. <laughs> uh, sometimes our bodies know more than we do. When we eat, especially as when we get older, when we eat, our blood pressure drops, probably because our, you know, gut blood vessels open up to, you know, deal with the meal. Um, it dropped more in E4 carriers after the high fat meal by 10 points more, so very clinically significant. And we don't know what that, we don't know if that's good or bad. We don't know the significance of that. But when we found that, I thought, well, I wonder what's happening to their brain blood flow because blood flow is very dependent on your systolic blood pressure. And I wonder what's happening there. It's called the lipid MRI study. And what it is, is I bring people in, they drink a lipid drink that's about the same amount of fat as they would have got in the meal and memory study. It's actually heavy cream. So they drink heavy cream and then we get a, a, spe a special kind of MRI called arterial spin labeling. And what that is, is it's non-invasive. It's in a way to just see where your blood flow is, both global and then regional. And we're just, uh, we've, run about six or seven people now through um, the goal is 90. And our hypothesis is that um, E4 carriers, once again, will have a different blood flow response to the heavy cream than the non-carriers. And we'll really be able to tell what from meal and memory, where we get blood chemistry and all of this fancy, um, uh, you know, blood sampling data, and then lipid MRI, where we get the fancy MRI data. I think we'll have a really nice profile of brain metabolism for E4 carriers and E4 non-carriers in response to high fat intake. And then I can give this data to other researchers who are studying diet and say, hey, do you wanna use these kind of biomarkers in your studies um, when you're doing you know, a big long diet study or a ketone diet study? Um, and the hope is that we can use these markers, especially the imaging biomarkers that are non-invasive to really get at, is this diet helping you? You know, because that's really what we want to know. Is this diet helping your brain? The lipid MRI study in particular, we're really excited about the screening visit. You come in for a screening visit, you get a lot of information about your brain health and your heart health. And what I do is I go through and um, write down any risk factors and I calculate people's um, heart disease risk 
and also just any risk factors that we identified. I'm really excited that the lipid MRI study provides as much information as possible that's helpful. And they get a one page uh, information sheet that they can take to their doctor. It's all real world um, numbers that they know what to do with. Because um, I always think this is information about that person. It's their information and they should have it about their own body. The metformin and Alzheimer's prevention study or the MAP study is going on right now. Um, it's a multi-site study and I'm the site PI here at University of Washington. And we're looking for people that have a high BMI that have mild cognitive impairment and are willing to take either metformin or a placebo to see if that helps their memory. There's this idea that one of the pathways to Alzheimer's is that you get brain insulin resistance um, and um, different metabolic risk factors such as a high BMI, or diabetes, or visceral fat, um, all those kind of risk factors that we think about for the metabolic syndrome or for diabetes, um, all those different risk factors um, may increase the risk or do appear to increase the risk of Alzheimer's, not just strokes and vascular disease, but actually um, Alzheimer's. And it appears that one of the mechanisms for that is as you uh, have peripheral insulin resistance, it alters the way the brain can take up insulin. And for some reason, the brain needs insulin. And we don't really know what the brain is doing with insulin because you don't need insulin in your brain to use glucose. It does something else. So that's kind of the big overarching story is that there's brain insulin resistance that leads to Alzheimer's disease, or at least is a part of of the process. So can we use diabetes drugs to not just treat diabetes, but also to treat Alzheimer's? Um, and they may be doing other things as well, anti-inflammatory effects, affecting mitochondrial function, things like that. So, um, so there's a long history of looking at diabetes drugs like metformin um, to improve insulin health, I guess, or you know that whole pathway. The current recommended healthy diet generally is a Mediterranean diet for, for most adults. So that's a little bit higher fat than like a heart healthy, low fat diet, um, um, but still emphasizes a lot of the same things, high fruits and vegetable intake, low intake of you know simple sugars and red meats. Should people take fish oil? I'll tell you what the guy who studies this for his life says. Um, if you eat fish a couple times a week, don't bother. So here in the, in the Seattle area, if you're eating a lot of salmon, if you're eating a lot of fish um, that has you know, DHA and EPA in it, it's likely that the fish oil isn't going to add much to your diet. Um, but for people who don't like fish or can't eat fish, or of course, a wide part of the world, that doesn't have access to salmon just everywhere, <laughs> um, then it may be um, that fish oil taken with a B-complex vitamin has some preliminary data. Uh, and it certainly, there's no evidence that it harms anybody. The dose is a little tricky and I can't really recommend a dose at this time. Um, every day I'm grateful for all of the people who, um, want to participate in research. So thank you so much.